Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is logarithms and decibels. Our objective is to take a quick look at logarithms and logarithmic properties on a very basic introductory level. Additionally, we'll examine the concept of gain expressed in units of decibels. Later lectures, we'll make use of logarithms and decibels to plot the performance of electrical circuits. This is a lecture for people that dislike logarithms, written, recorded, edited, and published by a person that also dislikes logarithms. Trust me, I've been there. As a first-year basic electronics student, way back when the wild mullet still cruised the earth, I distinctly recall thinking, as if basic electronics wasn't hard enough, they throw in a dubiously necessary level of mathematical complexity to make it that much harder. Ultimately, I learned logarithms because I had to. However, after gaining a little familiarity with logarithms, I grudgingly admitted they did serve a purpose. It didn't mean I liked them, but I did understand why they're used. My hope is that this lecture will provide you the tools necessary to get past this obstacle with a minimum of tears, sweat, and toil. You don't have to like logarithms, but you do have to coexist with them. Let us begin. You are no doubt familiar with exponentiation, where a base b is raised to a certain power x to yield a specific number n. Consider the expression 10 raised to the 2, which is 10 times 10, which yields 100. Similarly, consider 10 raised to the 5th power, which is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, which yields 100,000. Exponentiation needn't be restricted to a base of 10. Consider the expression 2 raised to the 3rd power, which is 2 times 2 times 2, which yields 8. Nor is exponentiation limited to rational numbers. Consider the expression e to the second power, which is e times e, or roughly 2.72 times roughly 2.72, which yields roughly 7.39. By now, you should have had plenty of experience with exponentiation. A logarithm, if you want to think of it this way, is exponentiation in reverse. It answers the question, to what power do you have to raise a base to get a specific number? The logarithm operation is written log with a subscript to the base b and the number n in parentheses, which yields the power x. Consider the expression, to what power do I have to raise 10 to get 100, written as log base 10 of 100. The answer is quite obviously 2, since 10 raised to the second power equals 100. Similarly, consider the expression log base 10 of 100,000. The answer is 5, since 10 to the fifth power equals 100,000. Similarly, log base 2 of 8 is 3, meaning 2 must be raised to the third power to get 8. Finally, log base e of 7.39 is 2 meaning e must be raised to the second power to get 7.39. A log lacking a base subscript means the base is assumed to be 10. This is sometimes referred to as the common log, since people commonly think in powers of 10. We could just as easily rewrite the first two examples as log 100 equals 2 and log 100,000 equals 5. Log base e also gets its own special notation as ln, which stands for logarithmus naturalis, or natural log, we could just as easily rewrite the last example as natural log of 7.39 equals 2. You'll recall we use the natural log function when we examine the transient charge and discharge process for capacitors and the transient storage and release process for inductors. Today's lecture deals with the common log only, where the common log again always utilizes the assumed base of 10. Way back in the days of the wild mullet, you had to look up the common log of a number in huge tables written in small print. But nowadays, scientific calculators make the job easy. To perform the common log function on the Texas Instruments TI-89 Titanium Edition Scientific Graphing Calculator, one can look up the log function in the catalog or simply press the light green diamond key followed by a 7 for a shortcut. The calculator says log followed by an open parenthesis. Let's say we want the common log of 100,000, which is asking the question, to which power do I need to raise the assumed base 10 to get the number 100,000? Diamond 7, enter 100,000, close the parentheses and hit enter. The calculator spits back the number 5, as you might expect. Let's try something harder. Consider the expression log of 40, meaning to which power do we need to raise the assumed base 10 to get 40? Diamond 7, enter 40, close the parentheses and press enter. The calculator spits back the number 1.6. Let's check our work. 10 raised to the power of 1.6 is indeed 40. Oh my gosh. It works. Your turn. Try these example problems on for size. Log of 90, log of 2400, and log of 8. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. 
You'll note that the number 8 being less than the base of 10 necessitates 10 be raised to a power of less than 1, in this case 0.9. This makes sense. Let's look at some other weird properties of logarithms. Try this one on for size. What's the log of 1? The calculator says 0, which again makes sense. Anything raised to the 0 power, in this case the base 10, raised to the 0 power is 1. What about the common log of positive numbers smaller than 1? Consider the expression log of 0.1. 10 raised to the negative 1 is 1 over 10 raised to the 1, or 1 tenth, where 1 tenth in decimal form is 0.1. What about log of 0, or log of a negative number? It don't work, so don't try it. Log functions only work for numbers greater than 0. We're left with a couple important observations about the common log function. Common log functions only work for positive numbers greater than 0. Logs of positive numbers smaller than 1 are negative. Log of 1 is 0. Logs of numbers between 1 and 10 are always less than 1. Log of 10 is 1. And finally, logs of numbers greater than 10 are always greater than 1. If you get answers that violate these rules, you are doing it wrong. The visual thinkers among you may wish to incorporate a plot of the common log function in their cheat sheet summarizing these guidelines. Here's some other helpful properties of logarithms. Log of a times b will be equal to the log of a plus the log of b. Log of a over b will be equal to the log of a minus the log of b. And finally, the log of a raised to the power n will be equal to n times the log of a. Let's do a quick application of these properties by way of illustrated examples. Consider the expression log of 12 times 50. We could multiply the numbers inside the parentheses to yield log 600, which yields roughly 2.78 or we could take the log of 12 and add it to the log of 50. Log of 12 is 1.08, log of 50 is roughly 1.7. 1 1.08 plus 1.7 is 2.78 as we anticipated. Similarly, consider the expression of log of 2400 over 30. We could divide the numbers inside the parentheses to yield log of 80, which yields roughly 1.9. Or we could take the log of 30 and subtract it from the log of 2400. Log of 2,400 is roughly 3.38. Log of 30 is roughly 1.48. 3.38 minus 1.48 is 1.9 as we anticipated. Finally, consider the expression log of 16 raised to the fourth power. We could perform the operation inside the parentheses to yield log of 65,536, which yields roughly 4.8. Or we could take the log of 16 and multiply it times 4. Log of 16 is roughly 1.2. 4 times 1.2 is 4.8, as we anticipated. Now that we've got an understanding of basic logarithms and basic logarithmic properties, let's answer an important question. Why is this useful? There's a couple of reasons why logarithms are employed in electrical circuit analysis. The first and most important reason being that it makes circuit analysis seem that much more arcane and mysterious than it really is. By obscuring straightforward analysis with a dubiously necessary level of mathematical complexity, it ensures generations of electrical engineering technicians continue to make top dollar. Second, logarithms make it possible to plot the response of a system for a wide range of values that would be unmanageable or impossible if done so using a linear scale. Third, similar to engineering notation, logarithms make it possible to quickly compare extremely large and extremely small numbers with one another. Four, many systems and properties exhibit nonlinear response to a stimuli. As we learned in the transient analysis of capacitors and inductors, these devices exhibit nonlinear natural logarithmic decay and rise functions. And finally, five, using the previously demonstrated properties of logarithms, it's possible to quickly determine the output of a cascaded series of systems, or one system's output is another system's input, and so on. First, allow me to demonstrate the utility of plotting numbers using logarithms. If I was to plot the response of a system over a broad range of frequencies, let's say from 0 Hz up to 1 MHz, using a linear horizontal scale, where numbers employ evenly spaced intervals on the horizontal axis, the graph would be unwieldy and almost impossible to use. If I started on the left-hand side and said every 1 inch means 1000 Hz, I'd quickly run out of room on my screen. Using a linear scale means a graph from 0 to 1 MHz will be 1000 inches wide. Even if we use paper in landscape orientation, this would take 87 pages of 8.5 by 11 notebook paper. If I was to draw a graph this big, it'd stretch from my office in the Dallas, Oregon, down the hill, through downtown, across the Columbia River, and into Murdoch, Washington, 
where he'd probably get stabbed in the back with a broken wine bottle by the dirty, dirty, paint-huffing subhumans that seemed to populate Murdoch. This is obviously not a workable solution. If, however, we use the semi-log plot, where the vertical y property, whatever it might be, is still represented linearly, and the horizontal x property, in this case frequency, is now represented logarithmically, it's possible to squeeze everything inside one nice neat chart and fit it on one page. The linear vertical y scale plots some property of interest, either voltage, current, or power in a traditional linear sense. However, the logarithmic horizontal x scale starts at 1 and spaces each power of 10 evenly. In this case, a power of 10 every 1 inch. 1 to 10 hertz is 1 inch, 10 to 100 hertz is 1 inch, 100 to 1000 hertz is 1 inch, and so on. The upper end of our horizontal scale, in this case 1 megahertz, is now only 6 inches away, making it possible to fit the chart on one page, leaving us with a whole bunch of unused pages in our notebook to start random fires with around the campus. Let's take a look at some semi-log paper. In a semi-log plot, you will note the compressed right side of the logarithmically scaled horizontal axis. Inside each equally spaced power of 10, you'll note a repetitive pattern. Consider the span from 1 to 10 hertz. At roughly 30%, we're at 2. At roughly 48%, we're at 3. At roughly 60% across, we're at 4. At roughly 70% across, we're at 5. At roughly 78% across, we're at 6. At roughly 85% across, we're at 7. At roughly 90% across, we're at 8. At roughly 95% across, we're at 9. And finally, at 100% across, we're at the next power of 10, in this case, 10. You may wish to take note of these percentages and numbers because they repeat themselves inside every power of 10. Consider a point, let's say, 60% of the way between 1,000 and 10,000 hertz. This means we're at roughly 4 times 1,000 hertz, or 4 kilohertz. Consider a point, let's say, 85% of the way between 100 hertz and 1,000 hertz. This means we're at roughly 7 times 100, or 700 hertz. Coming at this from a different direction, let's say we wish to identify where exactly 200,000 hertz or 200 kilohertz appeared on this chart. 200 kilohertz is between 100 kilohertz and the next highest power of 10, in this case the top of our scale at 1 megahertz. 200 kilohertz is 2 times 100 kilohertz. This means we'd be roughly 30% of the way between 100 kilohertz and 1 megahertz. Is interpreting numbers on semi-log plots easy? No, no it's not. Does it require practice? Yes, yes it does. That's the purpose of the hardware lab I drag you through each week. Believe me, you'll get more than enough practice. Is all this practice worth it? Yes, yes it is. Look at what we just did. We can plot an entire one megahertz range on a single graph and fit it on a screen. In summary, logarithms make it possible to cram lots of information into a very small space. Logarithms also allow us to quickly compare the performance of a system without getting lost in large or small numbers. A common property of interest is that of gain, where gain is amplification or increase of a given input signal. This is where we must necessarily divide system into two classes, active and passive. An active system produces output greater than input, and a passive system produces output less than input. Wait, 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 some of you might be saying. You're telling me an active system produces more output than input? This seems to be a violation of all the properties we've discussed since Basic Electronics 1. Allow me to explain. An active system's output is greater than its input. However, the excess output doesn't magically appear from nowhere, rather comes from supplementary sources. Consider an amplifier, the classic example of an active system, where some small electrical input signal is increased or amplified such that the output is greater than the input. An amplifier does this by drawing power from additional supplemental power sources that feed the amplifier, in this case a positive 15 and a negative 15 volt connection, thereby making it appear as if the output is greater than the input. A passive system, in contrast, is one in which the output is less than the input, because the input is attenuated or reduced by a certain amount. A passive system doesn't make use of external supplementary sources, and they're often constructed from very basic components, like resistors, inductors, and capacitors. The classic example of a passive system is an electrical filter, whereby input of varying frequencies input into the system, and the output selects, or passes only a specific band of frequencies. As the name implies, 
a low pass filter only allows certain frequencies less than a certain critical frequency, FC, to pass through, and anything above this critical frequency is stopped or rejected. Similarly, a high pass filter only allows frequencies greater than a certain critical frequency to pass through, and anything below this critical frequency is stopped or rejected. We'll examine low pass and high pass filters in later lectures. The larger point being this, the gain of active and passive systems is often expressed using units that make use of the logarithmic scale. The unit of gain is the bell, abbreviated using a capital B. Although in practice, gain is customarily expressed using units of decibels, where 10 decibels equals one bell. The property of interest for most systems is power, whereby gaining units of bells is defined as the log of output power over input power. If, however, we wish to express gain using the customary units of decibels, gain can be calculated as 10 times the log of output power over input power. This is a satisfactory means of calculating gain, however much easier and more practical methods exist. You'll recall that power can be calculated using a couple different methods, notably voltage times current, voltage squared divided by resistance, and current squared times resistance. Using the expression of voltage squared divided by resistance, if we assume resistance for both input and output to be the same, resistance cancels out, and we're left with gain in units of decibels equals 10 times the log of output voltage squared divided by input voltage squared. Simplifying this expression, we're left with gain in units of decibels equals 10 times the log of output voltage divided by input voltage squared. Note the double parentheses. Finally, using the previously discussed properties of logarithms, where the log of a raised to the power n will be equal to n times the log of a, this can be further simplified as 2 times 10, or 20 log of output voltage over input voltage. This is the easiest and most common formula used to calculate gain, since it necessitates simple non-invasive measurement of input and output voltage. By way of some illustrated examples, I hope to demonstrate some features of gain expressed in units of decibels. Let's first calculate the gain of a couple example active systems. For occasions in which output voltage is greater than input voltage, we should expect positive gain figures. Consider an active system which takes 5 volts input and amplifies it to 12 volts, a voltage increase of 2.4 times. Let's see if we can determine the gain in units of decibels. 20 times the log of 12 volts over 5 volts yields a gain of roughly positive 7.6 decibels. Consider a substantially more effective system, which takes 5 millivolts input and amplifies it to 12 volts, a voltage increase of 2,400 times. What's the gain of the second system in units of decibels? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following result. 20 log of 12 volts over 5 millivolts yields a gain of roughly positive 67.6 decibels. Gain in units of decibels for the second active system is still a pretty manageable number, the point being that expressing gain using logarithmic units still allows us to immediately recognize performance differences between two systems without having to resort to the use of extremely large numbers. Let's now examine the gain of passive systems. For occasions in which output voltage is less than input voltage, we should expect negative gain figures. Consider a low-pass filter system which passes electrical systems less than the critical frequency and stops or rejects frequencies above the critical frequency. Let's say this low-pass filter has a critical frequency of 500 Hz. Anything below 500 Hz should pass through relatively unmolested, and anything above 500 Hz should be attenuated or reduced. Let's see if this is the case. Let's say at 200 Hz, 12 volt input is reduced to 11.1 volt output. For a low-pass filter, 200 Hz is inside the passband. Let's see if we can determine the gain in units of decibels. 20 log of 11.1 over 12 yields a gain of roughly negative 0.7 decibels, meaning it is reduced, but not by much. Note this passive system has a gain with a negative sign since output voltage is slightly less than input, however, not by much. The low magnitude gain figure in units of decibels quickly tells us the output really isn't affected all that much inside the passband. Let's examine this filter's performance at frequencies higher than the critical frequency. Let's say at 1500 Hz or 1.5 kHz, 12 volt input is reduced to 3.8 volt output. What is the gain of this system at 1.5 kHz? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, 
you should have obtained the following results. 20 log of 3.8 over 12 volts yields the gain of roughly negative 10 decibels. Note that the second operating point this passive filter still exhibits a negative gain since output voltage is less than input. However, the larger magnitude of the gain figure quickly tells us the output is significantly reduced. That's the point. It's a low pass filter and anything above the critical frequency is supposed to be attenuated, reduced, or otherwise exhibit extremely low gain. There are a couple important points to make about gain expressed in units of decibels. As you gain more familiarity with decibels, use these observations as general guidelines. As we demonstrated, active systems can exhibit occasions in which output voltage is greater than input voltage. For these scenarios, we should expect positive gain in units of decibels. Passive systems, in contrast, exhibit occasions in which output voltage is less than input. For these scenarios, we should expect negative gain in units of decibels. Regions inside the passband of passive filters still exhibit negative gain. However, the absolute magnitude should be relatively small, meaning the output is relatively unaffected. In contrast, regions outside the passband of passive filters still exhibit negative gain. However, the absolute magnitude should be relatively large. That's the point of filters. They're filtering or removing something unwanted. In this case, an electrical signal above or below a certain critical frequency. Now for a couple special case scenarios, primarily related to passive systems. Consider an occasion in which output voltage equals input voltage. 12 volts in results in 12 volts out. The gain in this scenario is zero decibels. It makes sense because we're not amplifying or reducing anything. A gain of negative three decibels implies a condition of half maximum power. Oftentimes the half power point is used to determine the critical frequency of a filter. Anything inside the passband gets half power or more. Anything outside the passband gets half power or less. As we'll learn in the upcoming filters lecture, at conditions of half power, output voltage magnitude will be equal to the input voltage magnitude divided by square root two, or roughly 70.7%. Finally, a generally accepted standard for most applications assumes that when output voltage is one-tenth of input voltage, a scenario that implies one one-hundredth of maximum power, output is so effectively reduced it can be ignored. When output voltage equals one-tenth of input voltage, this represents a gain of approximately negative 20 decibels. Let's do a practical example of the last couple observations. Consider a filter operating at the critical frequency, such that 12 volt input is reduced to 8.5 volts output. 20 log of 8.5 over 12 yields a gain of roughly negative three decibels. It makes sense. We're at the critical frequency and we should be experiencing half power. The observant among you will note that 8.5 volts roughly equals the input voltage of 12 over square root two, or roughly 70.7%. We'll examine this feature in later lectures on passive filters. Consider a filter operating the stop or reject band where 12 volts input is reduced to 1.2 volts or one tenth of input. 20 log of 1.2 over 12 yields a gain of negative 20 decibels. This means we can kind of ignore this input. It makes sense. When output voltage is only 10% of input voltage, power would only be 1% of maximum, so we're not concerned about it. All right, that's about it for today. Yes, I have left a lot unsaid about logarithms and gain expressed in units of decibels, but this is all you need to know for now. We'll make use of logarithms and gain in later lectures on passive filters. In conclusion, this lecture introduced logarithms and gain expressed using units of decibels. We learned the basic structure of the common logarithm, how to calculate common logs using the scientific calculator, advantages of logarithms, properties of logarithms, plotting using semi-log charts, and calculation of gain in units of decibels. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.